Koiso uh, Ibab, welcome everybody. Um, really quite excited about this session today, to be honest. Um, some of you will remember that we, um, last year, round about this time, it was the 8th of July last year, um, we had our 10th anniversary uh, can do event, and I know a number of people uh, were at that. Um, both to sort of celebrate the toolkits, because you know, we, I think we, all of us can be justifiably proud of what we've managed to do in housing over the last decade or so. Um, but also to say, actually, it feels like the time is right to take this up to the to the next level, so to speak. So, you know, today really is the culmination of of work that we've been doing um, in the interim where we decided what we needed was almost like a manifesto, but we didn't want to call it a manifesto. So we came up with this idea of calling it a can-do um, declaration. Now we're going to be looking at that in some detail. You should have seen the link to it. Don't worry if you haven't had a chance to go through it in detail up until now, because um, the consultation on it is going to be open um, until really about three or four days before the 20th of July the 2nd, webinar that we're organizing and genuinely it's been shaped by dozens if not scores of contributions today so we really would appreciate you chipping in not just in the breakouts today but in writing during the seminar and also afterwards so that's a genuine and open invitation max could you put um, the first well the one slide you'll be glad to know you're not going to be powerpointed to death there is one slide that we're sharing with you today although how well uh, one of our presenters has got a series of slides that he's going to put in to um, the links that we're going to send out after this, uh, covering the ground that he's covering. So in terms of today, as I've said, um, this is essentially where we go next with the concept, the can-do concept, and specifically, I suppose, <coughs> the mechanisms that we need to put in place. Um, I, I keep saying that, you know, that, that this is genuinely a journey, not just an event. And Ron Davis called devolution a process, not an event. And it feels to me that, you know, and again, lots of people are in on this session today. I've been part of something that's really been quite exciting and innovative. And But it feels like not only haven't we arrived at a destination yet, but we've got huge, huge opportunities to go a lot further. And a lot of that, of course, is predicated by some of the circumstances we couldn't have foreseen that we now find we're facing. So just in terms of the um, format, Lee is going to speak uh, and tell us, essentially, he's got a free reign to tell us where he thinks we need to go in terms of the foundational economy. You, you've probably seen over the last couple of days, um, Helen White sent me something yesterday um, called uh, Our Future Wales. Um, which is an open invitation from government to come up with radical, interesting, innovative ideas. So really timely that Lee is, is going to speak to us today, because one of the things I obviously would be keen to know is how he sees this fitting into that uh, agenda. Um, Ed and how Will are going to tell us what, what really um, contractors feel about social value. I came across Ed, uh, I've known him for a while, but actually had a meeting with him before lockdown because he'd written something that I thought was as radical in terms of social value than anything I've ever seen. And, you know, sometimes contractors get a bad, a bad press, really, in terms of some of them are really, really good, others not so keen on this. And actually, from the trade organization for contractors to come out and say some of the things that Ed was saying was truly a, a breath of fresh air. Um, we're going to have a break um, after that, round about 11 o'clock, five minutes uh, comfort and tea break. And then we're going to go into the breakouts, which Joy uh, will facilitate one, I'll facilitate another. And they run for 40 minutes, but we'll switch you around after um, 20 minutes. So just in terms of one or two um, contextual issues, really, before we go into the um, session itself. Um, as I've said, the declaration is going to be co-produced. Um, but in a sense, since we started this uh, process off a year ago, you know, W.V. Yeats has got a great phrase um, in his poem, Easter 1916. He says, all changed, changed utterly. And if it ever was true, it's true now. You know, three months ago, you know, if a can-do approach was something we should have been pursuing with energy, then we really ought to be flat out now, considering the, the scale of the challenges that we're, that we're, we're facing. I'm not going to rehearse those. You know, we all know the the health economy and indeed the climate uh, emergencies that we're facing. Um, but what I'd like to say is that this seminar fits into 
what seems a bit like a crowded space, if you like. Um, ideas are not socially distancing at the moment. There's an awful lot going on in terms of what we need to, to do next. But I think that's great. I think it feels to me like ideas are, are relevant again, you know, and ideology gets a bad press. But actually, what we're, what we're seeing now is despite all the challenges and the horrible things that are happening, people are genuinely interested in radical approaches. So you've got the build back better. Uh, if you follow that hashtag, you see loads of stuff coming out on that at the moment. And Sophie Howe, who's going to speak at our next webinar, is championing that, and she's come out with um, five priorities, and she's consulting on them at the moment. But she thinks really need to be taken on board urgently if we're going to build back better. And Kelly Byrne, who's also speaking at our second webinar, um, is launching shortly a challenge fund aimed at putting some resources into that space so that we can come up with innovative uh, ideas in the Cardiff capital region to build back better. Um, Reset Company, something Joy and myself have been involved in, and John Jackson, who's on the line, is, is really a, an attempt to throw some ideas out there without creating some sort of organization and think tank. We genuinely want to encourage debate. So if you go to um, the Twitter site, Reset Cymru, you'll see there's an awful lot of discussion going on there as well on um, a number of ideas that people have come up with. Um, and again, absolute open and genuine um, invitation to chip in on that and help shape it. And as I mentioned earlier on, um, just in the last few days, our Future Wales has been launched. Um, I've seen emails from Ken Skates and Julie James um, saying, please, 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 chip in your radical ideas because we face unprecedented challenges and we really do need to get some good thinking going on this. Um, and the final point I would make is a housing one. The audience today is mainly uh, housing. Um, but housing, I think, has got a special place, not just in terms of reflecting on its history of being in this space, you know, sharing um, social, economic and environmental objectives with government, being a key partner in all of those areas, um, but also in terms of its potential after we come through this. Housing organisations are on the ground. They're in some of our most, all of our most marginalised uh, communities. And we're strong and robust organisations, not without challenges, not without uh, our own difficulties, but nevertheless a commitment there to actually invest in communities and to work in partnerships. So um, things like the green recovery, for example, I think um, housing organisations must surely be one of the key partners um, in that. Just very briefly on the declaration itself, those of you who've had a look at it will see there's 10 points in there. I just wanted to um, emphasize um, three or four things really. The starting point for me is um, that we need to redefine value and, and set that within the framework, again, in my view, of, of the Future Generations Act and the work of the commissioner. And the reason I say that is because there are a number of definitions of value and also we've managed to somehow cloud some of that by over complexity in my view. I think value needs to be about absolutely driving the maximum social, economic, environmental and cultural benefits from the money that we spend. Um, it's, it's really not complicated, but we need to have a common definition of value in order to engineer that, to drive it through everything um, that we do. The second point is specifically around procurement. Um, one of the ideas that we've been throwing around for a while and is in the declaration is what we call the procurement flip. Um, Joy brought this to my attention in relation to some work that was being done in the supported housing sector. But essentially the concept is, at the moment you talk to procurement professionals and they'll tell you, yes, it's okay to you know, weight things in terms of quality and social value, but you know that you're going to get it in the neck from your FD or your chief exec even who are going to be saying, yeah, that's all well and good, but actually we need to come in, you know, make sure the costs are controlled here. Um, and we're saying, actually, what we should be doing is giving people a hard time if the cost is the lowest, when the tender comes through as the lowest, how can we accept that? Surely there must be something missing from this. Surely we're not getting the full potential. So we actually um, question go into that sort of low cost default position even if it is inadvertently because of pressures from within organizations and the example that i always give i did some work 
um, last year with Kensington and Chelsea in the tenants and residents post Grenfell. Um, and if you want to know um, how costly low cost is, over and above the tragedy of all the lives that have been lost and the a human cost that continues to this day, think how costly shaving three million pound off a Cladin contract has turned out. You know, so I think we've really got to get our heads around that value is not a temporary expedient thing and it's not something we define in the immediate and short term. It needs to be defined in a much longer um, time scale. A couple of other points, um, you know, and if Lee isn't, hasn't joined us, what I'll do is I'll open up some discussions on, on, on these. Hi, Dave. Sorry. Oh, sorry, Lee Jersey. Lee's here, yeah. All right, okay. Um, so a couple of other points before I finish. Um, we firmly believe that the lesson of the toolkits was that you do need to have very focused and robust means of engineering this into procurement and commissioning. I, I bang on at this at, like, at every opportunity. We need a new generation of tools. We need to unclutter what's already there. We need to simplify things, but we need a new generation of universal tools co-produced by clients, contractors, and communities that are fit for purpose and actually can help us deliver what are going to be incredibly difficult challenges. Um, and the immediate priority, as I've said earlier on, has to be to use the opportunities in the green economy for a can-do approach. It's there, it's waiting for us. We haven't cracked the resourcing issue. But from the Welsh Housing Quality Standard Programme of 10 years ago, um, where we, we, we managed to get the money, it was important to do the thinking before you got to that point, because it's too late to talk to colleges, it's too late to get it into contracts. Once it's up and running, we need to start doing the thinking um, on that uh, now. So the final point is, um, Alistair, I think it was on the line, always says, what's the exam question for today? What is it we want to do? I think the overriding exam question, once we've heard from our speakers, is how can we redefine value beyond this sort of lowest price? And people say, well, we already do, but I don't think we do really. I think there's always a pressure to look at cost. And actually, it's a false, false economy. And we'll do that and explore that um, in the breakouts. Um, so I just wanted to say that by way of introduction. Um, did you say, Max, that Lee is online now? Yes, I'm here. Oh, good, good, Lee. So listen, I'm not going to steal any more of your time. We were just wondering whether you would manage to make it for 10.15. So I'm not going to introduce you any further than say it's over to you, Lee. Okay, thanks very much. I'd like to be brief and take part in the conversation, really, because um, you know there's a danger we preach to the converted, telling us stuff that we all agree with, and not much point in that. Uh, I think you know the last since we last got together in TechniQuest, clearly um, the COVID crisis has all hit us sideways, and COVID has been a huge challenge for this agenda because it has inevitably diverted uh, focus and resource. Uh, towards dealing with the immediate crisis but it also has created I think less an opportunity more an imperative that this agenda now has to be mobilized rapidly in order to deal with the tsunami of economic forces that are uh, beginning to be uh, thrown at us and we'll feel more in the weeks and months to come so you know I think what's great about the approach that you've been leading with colleagues is the is the can-do element of it but we you know we really now move into must-do um, because the can do as, uh, as, uh, has its limitations because it also implies that you can't do it, um, both in terms of it's too difficult, but also because um, all, all, all sorts of other false barriers that are being put up. And I think we really need to galvanize ourselves now to see the imperative of action in the short term. Uh, and I think that's something that's eluded us so far, but we've seen how the system has responded to a single challenge in the face of COVID. Uh, and the complexity that normally clutters uh, our activity has dissolved and allowed us to have this motivation. And we, we need to have a similar um, mindset as we approach the economic fallout from COVID as well, because that puts a rocket booster under all the challenges we've already been dealing with. And it places an obligation on us to, to cast aside false barriers and focus on what can be done with the public spend that we already have in Wales within our power, uh, within our spending envelope. This is money we have uh, and uh, we need to use it better to stop money leaking out so we get the well-being uh, benefits you've talked about and also trying to do something practical about the huge uh, social and economic uh, damage that's going to be uh, 
hitting us because of COVID. So those are practical things that, that we are now doing. And, and, and I've been extremely frustrated by the, by the progress to date. Things you know, we are making progress, but the pace at which we're making progress isn't as fast as I'd like it to be. Um, and there are, there are a number of reasons for that. But what we're doing uh, at the moment is that we, we've established now a community of practice that has been, a uh, contract has been let, is not yet quite op operational. So the 52 uh, foundational trials that we put in place uh, will now be able to come together and share and challenge. Um, we've, uh, we've put together some forums of our own in the last couple of weeks where different themes of those projects have come together to understand what they're up against. Uh, so that work is, uh, is, is underway. We expect some of the projects that we funded under the challenge program not to be able to proceed because of the, uh, the, the challenges that the crisis has brought. Uh, I'm determined, you know, some have asked, can we extend the deadline beyond next March? And I don't want to do that because I don't want us to treat this as a grant management program or a, a bunch of pilots. This is a short term, a challenge based uh, set of trials. I mean, to learn from them. They need to fail fast if they're going to fail. I mean, to scale fast if they're going to succeed. And that hasn't been happening. Um, the progress has been too slow. Uh, so, I, I, you know, we, we haven't got time to be hanging around. So if projects can't deliver by the end of March, then they need to stand back and let those that can uh, come forward. And we have some reserve schemes and we're potentially looking at some, some others as well. So that's work that's going on now to properly establish which ones can go ahead, which ones can't, those that can properly engage in the community of practice so that we are making uh, the most of the knowledge uh, to achieve the change. And then the second strand of our foundational uh, work, the first is trials, the second is uh, spread and scale. And that's the work that Claire's the Centre for Local Economic Strategies from Manchester, who worked with Preston and Islington and uh, Merseyside and all the rest are working with us on that. So they uh, have now uh, delivered uh, of analysis of spend for those PSPs that are working with us on clusters. So we've had, uh, uh, we've written out all PSPs to ask them do they want to take part in this work. We've had responses um, from a number and we are work we have got them working together in clusters. So there's a Gwent cluster, there's a Kuntav cluster, there's a cluster of Carmarthenshire, Cardigan and Powys, and then there's a cluster in the north of Fincher and Denbyshire. We are delivering support to them via the analysis Claire's has provided uh, so they can properly look at uh, what spend is currently falling within region and out of region. And we're working specifically with the NHS for the NHS to become lead anchors uh, within the PSPs to drive forward that work. And we're focusing particularly on food procurement and on PPE procurement, because we've seen on the work of PPE, there's the nonsense of long supply chains, uh, the huge vulnerability that, that creates for us on well-being critical uh, equipment, and the vulnerability we have by going for low cost as the, as the primary driver, uh, where you know we just can come within days in some cases of not having things that are welfare essential because they're held up in airports in Cambodia. Uh, you know that can't be that can't be right when we can produce this stuff uh, closer to home. So you know, we are now, for example, all the scrubs being used in NHS Wales are being produced in Wales. Some of them by a Better Jobs Closer to Home project uh, in Ebu Vale, who's in long term uh, and employed uh, for a uh, competitive cost and a much higher source of value. Uh, so we think that using the momentum we've already generated around PPE and the common sense case that we can make for PPE procurement closer to home, we're going to try and uh, accelerate that with NHS purchases and also then food. So uh, we know that Brexit's really going to hammer food producers uh, in the new year. So there's a double imperative there to try and use our public spend to try and shore up that sector, uh, shorten the supply chains and deliver uh, better quality food at a, at a price that is uh, properly reflecting its value to the local economy. So the Kamal shows one of the trials for, is doing a project on food. We're working with Lewis Lucas, who's the head of uh, procurement in Caffini, who's the lead on uh, food for the WLGA, to try and see if we can quickly scale that up. And quickly is, is the bit that I'm finding elusive in, uh, in government for all sorts of complex reasons. But that's what we've got to put right. We've also got Liz working with us to put together a, foundation, a procurement expert panel, uh, which includes Jane Lynch from Cardiff University, who's been working with Sophie Harris, part of her review, Kevin Morgan, uh, and others, including a senior lawyer, to look at those 10 projects we've got within the trial fund we're working on procurement. Uh, uh, to start with, to, to look at the problems they're coming up against and, and act as a sort of a, a court of appeal, if you like. 
So if their procurement departments are telling them no, this panel of experts can tell them, well, there's a different way of doing it. And that's precisely within the can-do spirit that Keith and others have marshaled so successfully over the last 10 years. But I think we, they need you know, some, some disruption in this uh, space. And, and Liz and her expert panel will hopefully provide that so initially to the trials, but then applying those lessons uh, more broadly. Uh, so I think I'll stop. I'll stop there, Keith. Because uh, I'd be interested in taking part in the in the discussion about it. But you know, there's there's, there's stuff that we're already doing. COVID has, has knocked some of that sideways, but it's also provided us, I think, with a, a, galvan, a galvanizing spirit to try and get it back on track quickly. Uh, none of this is simple or easy, or as it would have been done by now. Um, but 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 I'm determined we can do as much as we can as quickly as we can. But ultimately, this is down to everybody else in the conference. This is, I can, I can huff and I can puff, but only you can blow the house down. Um, and we've got, you know, we've got, uh, we've got to marshal our collective uh, passion here and, and uh, ability to do, to make, to turn this from rhetoric to action. Yeah. Thanks, Lee. That's, that's, that's an excellent start. Can, can I, I'm, I'm going to ask people to sort of think about questions, but can I be cheeky and chip in with one um, first, in sort of abuse my position as chair? Um, you're right about can do, and also, you know, I, I think, you know, we, speak, we project housing as being the can do sector, but I think it's also the go to sector. I think, you know, we're in communities, you know, when government wants to get things done, you know, we're, we're, we're able and willing partners. So it's just two questions for you, really. And I, obviously, I get the PPE and food need to be priorities, but you've got these community energizers, community sort of organizations across Wales. Um, what's your feeling about how housing could step up and be part of this new agenda? Um, and not exclusively on the green recovery, because we haven't hacked the funding of that yet. Um, but, you know, what's your feeling about housing and what role it could play? in this, as you said, get, get things up to speed very quickly because we ain't got the time to mess around with your scenario. Well, I'm not stopping housing doing it, Keith. Do, I'm not saying you're stopping it yet, no, I'm saying what's no. your view about it? Well, I'm saying is my view is they do, nobody needs the Welsh Government's permission to be getting on and doing this stuff. And you, you've already demonstrated through your toolkits how it can be done and how it has been done. And we heard effectively at the last conference the examples of how that was done in the past. So there's the thing, the thing that central government in Wales is doing to stop this from happening. There's dispersed leadership here. You've got the budgets, you've got the tools, you've got the will, crack on. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the, I think the green recovery does provide an opportunity to put rocket boosters on, on the agenda. And I'm very excited by the possibilities uh, that the work um, that, that's, that's been done for Julie James as part of the innovative housing program and the, the retrofit ideas presents. Our huge challenge is resource. You know, the Welsh budgets are shot through. The cost of doubling NHS critical capacity, the cost of providing half a billion pound of economic assistance to stop businesses going bust, I guess comes at a cost. You know, we're spending 100 million on field hospitals. That's 100 million without spending on other things. Uh, and, and the ability uh, to, to marshal an effective <coughs> package in that context is clearly very challenging. Now, the UK government have to step up here. I need to stop seeing this as a six month crisis and see this as a 20 year crisis and, and continue the sort of stimulus they've provided brilliantly, to be fair, with the furlough scheme. You know, hats off to them on that, but they mustn't end it too soon and too crudely. And there has to be significant stimulus now to get the economy going because we're only in the foothills of the economic blowback from COVID and it's going to get, uh, it's going to get ugly, I think. Uh, so, so this, you know, we need the, we need the funding uh, collectively as a UK released. To, to be able to fight that, uh, but providing we have that, I think housing has a, has a massive role to play, leading leading that effort. And the foundational uh, element to that has, has got to, has got to be key. But but, but the, the thing I'm keen to explore Keith, is what is stopping people on this call now from doing all the things that you've shown to do that, that works. Mm. So, so let's 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 open it up at that point then, Lee, because I suspect, or I know, in fact, I know people who are on the call are actually, you know, shoulders to the wheel, you know, sleeves rolled up, involved in this stuff, and you know, probably more so now than they've ever been. So, does anybody want to chip in um, a question first, or, but or a contribution, to be honest? Um, whilst we've got Lee on the line.
I'll come in, Keith, if I can. Yeah, yeah, of course, please, please do. Um, Michelle Reed from Merth Valley's Homes. Uh, morning, everybody. Um, I think all of what you're saying, Lee, is absolutely spot on. I think what, what we've probably been doing over the last three months is, is similar to Welsh Government, similar to our local authorities, is really helping where we can and creating a bridge particularly for community organisations. I know, I know my organisation's funded a lot of the emergency stuff, you know, it's just helped to fund food preparation, food delivery, all of that kind of stuff, and, and try to make the difference between some organisations, um, you know, being able to carry on operating and not being able to carry on operating. I suppose now it's how do we galvanize things to make the bigger changes and the bigger impacts and I, I think we're kind of getting our ducks in a row after the emergency um so i think there's definitely a will just to give you some um cause for optimism i think there's definitely a will for us to get going i think we're just kind of making the wheels move faster again as well um within our our organizations and balancing all the all the difficulties that that people have faced in our organisations as well. So um, I definitely think that, um, you know, the will is absolutely there and there's nothing stopping us and we will get going. Cheers, Michelle. Does anybody want to, before I ask Lee to come back in, I've got a couple of other comments, questions. Okay. Yep. Cheers, John. Um, just a quick comment, and I think around procurement. It is about attention to detail. Um, I worked with Joy when we refurbished the offices at Quaratag, and you often find in office uh, reception areas that you've got the IKEA Trophy Award cabinet, and <laughs> instead we use a self-employed female carpenter to make car cabinets, and that's part of the foundational economy, isn't it? You know, thinking, do I buy something which has been made in China and shipped to Wales? Do I make a bit more effort to find somebody locally who can make exactly the same thing for us? And I think it's incumbent on everyone to actually start making a bit more effort about what you buy and where you buy it. Very good point. Very good point. Anybody else want to come in? Yeah, Keith, can I can I say something? Um, yeah, you know, we've, yeah, yeah. Uh, we've we've just done a piece of work actually with the Welsh government in terms of looking at um, procurement and commissioning respect to social care linked to the social services and wellbeing bill. And I think it's important not to think about procurement as an isolated function because actually procurement is just the facility or the function by which you purchase. But actually thinking about the commissioning function and actually considering yeah. what it is you're buying and actually rather than buying something, why don't you buy something which has got social value inherent to it? And I think the, you know, the Welsh Government contract where Elite obviously is now kind of delivering PPE is a really good example of that. So rather than just buying a facility that makes clothing, you purchased a facility that makes clothing, but as an intermediate labour market, and then the procurement almost follows from that kind of purchasing desire. So it's just a plea really not to think about procurement in isolation. I think there's a, a, a kind of a broader um, approach that needs to be taken really. That's a very good point, Rian. And, and to be fair, the, de the declaration talks about commissioner and procurement, but we sort of shorthand it to procurement. But you're absolutely right. It sits within something at a, at a higher level in a way, a strategic level, you know, where people have to set the sort of standards they expect to be followed through the entire process. Yep, absolutely. Anybody, anybody else want to come in? Yeah, Keith, it's, it's Nick from, from Link. I, I was just going to say, I think that it's, it, we've seen a lot of the work. Um, I, I've been involved um, as part of the housing um, being represented on the MPS, Welsh Government, local authority discussions on PPE. So I've been quite close to some of the, um, the updates from Simon Griffiths and his team about bringing PPE e production into Wales. Um, and I think we just, um, we need to work now at a policy level but also at our local organizational levels around putting procurement um, up at the top table because making um, as we were talking about procurement it isn't just a process it's about thinking a little bit more putting more time into to getting the right things and buying that value the the best way to do that is to make sure procurement's involved early in the decision making process and being part of that whole commissioning thing otherwise you get to a stage where lots of decisions have been made and you're expected to buy something 
Um, and then it's sometimes quite difficult to start then looking at putting that value into what you're buying and, and looking at where you're sourcing it from because you've got limited time and limited resource to do that. And it's, it's something Sophie Howe's picked up on that we need to put procurement at the top table and being part of those discussions early on so that it becomes much more of a, a commissioning piece um, rather than um, just a, a go and buy it piece. And that's how we're going to, I think, get... Um, sustainability in a lot of this work that we've done it's great ppe production is in wales but it, we've got to make sure it, it remains there and the only way to do that is to make it sustainable thanks nick that's very helpful and nick is going to be joining um ed and how well in the um uh, client and contract uh, break that we go to um after these first sessions um anybody else well at least still on the line yet to to sort of chip in and make make an observation or ask a question um, I was just going to uh, chip in quickly, uh, David here from, uh, from Valleys to Coast. Um, I think if we look back over 10 to 15 years of, of WHQS, there is a lot of good that came out of that, but there is so much more of it. And I'm thinking in particular in the early days, um, a lot of those big contracts being, um, being swept up by the, um, by the big nationals uh, and, and the value not being returned from those. Um, I'm, I'm also really hopeful now that, that, that what comes out of, of the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, and there's a, there's a lot of talk and a lot of recognition, particularly in Wales, it is that, it is that green recovery um, that, that, can really, um, that can really move forward. But there's been so many false starts on it. Um, there have, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, from Arbed 1 to Arbed 3, to the different programmes that have gone on, there have been so many false starts. Um, I'm talking to a lot of, the, of the, the smaller SMEs now who have sort of said, yeah, do you know what, you've said all of this before, you've said before, no cliff edges. And, and I think what, what this really needs is, is that absolute clarity of stated will on it, um, but no two ways about it. It's got to be backed up with, um, with a meaningful funding offer as well. Um, I think, you know, most of the, the organisations in the room are, are stood ready and willing to, to absolutely embrace that, but I think there's got to be... There's got to be that impetus behind it, and there's no two ways about it. The what we're looking at as organisations to to decarb um, is is unaffordable, but it's unaffordable not to do it because when you when you look at the impact on uh, you know on our customers, on our communities, on SMEs, it's it's enormous. You know, it it, it can uh, it can make the absolute difference. So I think I think what we are looking at, and and I'm looking at. Uh, I'm looking at Lee and remembering um, uh, seeing him quite a few years ago and uh, wandering into a couple of houses down in Shineshi to, to have a look at what was being done under, uh, under our bed too. But it's, 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 that, it's that delivery at scale. And, you know, what distresses me is where some people have, have talked about, um, you know, quick training, low-skilled jobs uh, in terms of the green recovery, to do it well. It's not that. Um, and I'd echo one of the earlier comments of, you know, we really need to be looking at those colleges, looking at the, at looking now at, at what those skills are going to be, um, you know, the next five and ten years down the, uh, down the line. But there's got to be, there's got to be an impetus and commitment um, behind it to, to match what I think, you know, the, um, the housing movement is, is ready to step up and do. Cheers, Dave. I'm going to bring Duncan in a second, but just one quick observation. I share your pain on this. I mean, our bed one, we actually, eye to eye, the country took us, did a lot of work with business in the community with a group of private sector organisations who were really up for it. And because of the gap between our bed one and our bed two, there was a huge amount of cynicism about how sustainable this whole thing was. So the key word for me is we've got to make sure that this is sustainable this time, because that's the way the foundational economy will develop real jobs, quality jobs, but long-term jobs, you know, that's what we need to be thinking about. Anyway, Duncan, Duncan Forbes wants to come in. Thanks, Keith, and good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, just a quickie, really. I think a lot could change if the ministers just ask different questions. So if every time the health minister meets uh, the chair of a health board to ask to find out about new hospitals, they ask the question, 
what extra value you're getting in this contract. If every time the education department approves a new school, they ask what extra value you get in this contract, instead of what's the cost, or as well as what's the cost, immediately yeah. the whole philosophy and culture would change and people would go back to their offices and say, well, what value are we getting? And then all of a sudden, it would permeate right down the chain. So it really is, Welsh Government have, because they fund a lot of the work that's going on, have huge power to make things happen. We can happen anyway, no one's stopping it, but in terms of getting it to happen in places where it's not really seen as a priority, it can be done by the change of conversations. Brilliant. Thanks, Duncan. Any last comments, questions? Um, you know, and I, I will ask you if you want to come back and, 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 and reflect on some of the things people have said. Anybody else? Can I just add some in, Keith? And it follows yeah, on from what Helen. Yeah. It's Helen from TAF. And I mean, I'm really pleased that obviously we've got you as a board member at TAF and you've really challenged us as an organisation to, to think again about making sure we are delivering value from the procurement that, um, that we are doing. I think the difficult thing, and I think it does lead on from what Duncan was saying, is that at a macro level, you know, we, we get that those, the, the will is there. And I think you're right about changing the nature of the conversations to be asking those questions. I think what some organisations struggle with, particularly perhaps smaller organisations, is actually the skills. And I know, and I totally agree with what Frian said, it's not just a procurement issue, but actually getting people within our organisations to think beyond that cost um, narrative, that is a skills issue. And I think we, that's where I would really like some support is absolutely buy into it at the macro level. It's how we make it happen at the micro level so that we've got, you know, obviously people like Nick at Link are doing a brilliant job, really gets it. Whereas not all of us have that um, internal expertise around procurement. So I think any support to help those doing the procurement on the ground would be, would be brilliant. Brilliant, thanks Ellen. Very good practical point there. Um, one final shout for anybody who wants to come in and I'm gonna ask Lee then to sort of um, to come back. Is that okay? Keith, can I just ask one? Sorry, it's Rian again. Yeah, of course, Rian. Yeah, yeah. It's just a very practical question to uh, Deputy Minister, really, is just timelines around, um, obviously, there's a number of projects, interesting projects that are on the reserve list, just to get a sense of, I suppose, when Welsh Government might be making that decision of when current projects might not be able to fulfil their delivery obligations and when Welsh Government might be looking at opportunities to commission some of those reserve projects, really. Okay, that's a specific one um, for, for, for Lee, but I don't know if you want to deal with that firstly or, or, or reflect on other things you've heard. Oh, well, a good question, Rian, because uh, I'm finding there's often a lag between me asking for something to happen and it actually happened. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the honest answer is I'm not certain, um, but, but it needs to happen quickly. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm on the case. Um, I thought Duncan's point was absolutely spot on. Um, this is about leadership and consistency. You know, we as a government have said that the financial economy is a key part of our uh, COVID priority response. But then inevitably, you know, politics works on uh, fits and starts and short timescales. You know, we have an election in May, uh, COVID allowing, uh, and, and, you know, and we have um, an opportunity through the response to the crisis before then to try and galvanise the system. But you know, listen to some of the comments. You know, in terms of you know what an ideal situation would be, you know, about scale and about consistency and, and so on. Things being set up to succeed, I agree with that. But we must let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You know, what is the short-term opportunity we have to kickstart this? And help me to understand what are the blockers, and help me to understand how we can remove the blockers. Uh, and so for sh for short-term movement. Uh, and then the collective challenge we had is how do we transfer short-term movement into medium-term and longer-term action? Because I'm acutely conscious that the communities of practice we're just putting in place are only going to run till the end of March. You know, my term as a minister only runs till uh, May, unless I do something stupid in the meantime, it's even shorter. Uh, and, uh, you know, so so th these are, th these are um, imperfect timescales because change takes time. But on the other hand, in terms of the, you know, the fast moving, you've seen what's happened so quickly in the last four months. You know, we can make change happen quickly when we're all when we're all got the will to do it. Uh, so I you know I'm getting tired of saying the same things now about the uh, about the, the strategic direction of the policy. It's the doing that matters because the rest is just talking, uh, and the doing is not something I can do alone. Uh, um, and it would really help me to understand the bias 
you were coming up against, real and perceived. You know, this is a small country, I'm, I'm not hard to get hold of. Drop me an email, give me examples of problems we're facing, and together we work, work through them one by one. And hopefully through that, create the momentum uh, to show what can be done. And then just a final point for me, it's just in terms of capacity point, the last couple of interventions made about the, the Helen's point about having the skills available to do it. And that's where I think we've just got to collaborate. Um, because, you know, the, the skills are there, we've just got to come together and, and, and help each other. So hopefully this expert group that um, Ms. Lucas is going to uh, head for us will be one source of procurement can-do expertise that everybody can tap into to deliver this agenda. But I dare say on this call, there's, there's more expertise on this call than there is uh, anywhere else, or at least as much as. And, and what can you all do collectively to help each other and provide learning? And obviously the toolkit that Keith has developed has got some of that, but in terms of ongoing, chivying, helping, supporting, nudging and so on, you know, what, what can we all do together to help that agenda get some traction? Cheers, Lee. And I mean, it reminds me as well, because the toolkit came out of the i to i project and the i to i project worked in that space between sort of high level proclamation and, and delivery on the ground. And I think one of the beauties, I mean, Kevin Morgan referred to it as skunk works because we essentially had a free reign to be as anarchistic and as radical as we wanted to be. But what we did was we morphed into that space and whatever we needed to be to make sure that the high level strategy got implemented, we were in that space. So I think it's perhaps time to revisit that as a concept. You know, there's this linear line that never seems to work between high level strategy and delivery. It's the space in between, I think, is really interesting. And, and a little bit of resource in that space, I think, could pay high dividends. Um, any, I, I'm, I'm probably going to stop at that point with Lee, if that's okay. 